G'day guys, welcome to another very special Pink Panda video. Tonight we've got former Bulldog and Hawthorne superstar Brian Lake, who's won three premierships and a Norm Smith medal, on the show tonight for a live chat. Um, he's open and honest about his time with the Dogs, at the Hawks, Survivor, and other little bits in between, so I hope you enjoy. That's right, I've got Dogs as well, it's, uh, it's all good. <laughs> Whatever happens, happens, it's just a lot of the punches. So, good evening, Roddy, hope everyone is doing well. Welcome to a, a very special episode of Panther Chat, and we're still out to find a new name for the show. I don't really like it, but it was the best I could come up with at very late notice. So we just push on and, and do, and yeah. So the Pink Pan is, it's, um, I suppose it started from when a few of us were playing an NBA video game together and everyone yeah. looked the same. And you couldn't tell each other apart. And so we kept throwing turnovers, which was quite frustrating. So we went to, uh, they got like an NBA store on there mm -hmm. and just bought all Pink Pants so we could tell each other apart so we could actually, uh, we could actually play. But and then it just yeah. kind of stuck, but um, yeah, nothing. It's nothing too exciting. But um, special guest night, obviously, everybody. So Brian Lake, who was draft pick seventy one in the two thousand one draft by the mm -hmm. Bulldogs, he wore number thirty six for the Dogs for one hundred ninety seven mm -hmm. games, kicking thirty two goals, and then of course number seventeen for the Hawks uh, after fifty four games and two goals. And what a resume, though! Two All Australian, one Charles Sutton Medal winner, three premierships, mm -hmm. and Norm Smith medalist. Uh, absolute superstar, mate. Thank you for jumping on tonight. Appreciate it. No worries, Chris. Thank you. I, as everyone can probably see, I'm in my uh, my movie room at the moment. I've got dogs barking, so I do apologise for that. Uh, they're trying to get in here. Um, That's I'm looking right. at updating. I'm looking at updating. The projectors are old school now. You can get these 85 inch TVs and 95 inch TVs. So I'm just waiting for them to go down in price. But um, I'm sitting in my movie room. It looks like you're sitting in your garage with all that stuff yeah. behind it. Unfortunately, I've been relegated to the garage. So prior to our second <laughs> child arriving, I had a man cave set up in the yeah. spare bedroom for about six months. And then second kid was on the way. And uh, I'm out here having the, you know, when we work from home and, and do this stuff. So not not ideal conditions because it gets bloody cold out here as well. So. Yes. But uh, yeah, you're, you're definitely doing it in a lot better style than what I am. Um, a lot to get through question wise you've yeah, had yeah. such uh, an amazing career we'll start mm. from the i uh, start from the beginning here with the with the doggies you're mm. overlooked in the 2000 draft do you know if if you were close to being drafted that year and how hard was that to digest as a 18 year old um yeah back in sort of late 90s and, and 2000 when i went to the uh, the I, I went to the national draft camps i did all the um i did under 18s got selected for south australia um for the tournament so i think there's 70 guys got invited to go to canberra to do the um uh the draft camp back in the, the old school days so um at that stage you think yeah you're a, you're a reasonably good chance of, of getting drafted i think it's 80 or 90 percent of players uh, that go to that get uh, back in those days get drafted so uh, i'd spoken to Fremantle, um spoken to geelong a, a couple of times so um and and the bulldogs as well but nothing was sort of um uh, guaranteed and and for myself i had some health issues uh for a couple of years there i had um really big, bad sleep apnea and ironically um at the draft camp i uh, i'd had tonsillitis uh reasonably badly oh, so uh yeah i couldn't i couldn't do much i had uh, a couple of meetings um but i was pretty much bedridden uh for all that time so um yeah did that affect it uh, i probably wasn't the the fittest guy so i was probably lucky i missed the um the beat test in the, in those uh, in those days that uh, I wouldn't have impressed anyone with uh, with my VO two max at that stage. Um, so but yeah, you, you, you think at that stage you, you're reasonably confident they're going to get drafted, but they um, yeah. they're not not going in that year. You go back and play under 19s footy for Woodville West Torrens at that stage. You think oh, maybe your, your time's passed. I was reading about the the sleep apnea issue and mm. how how did you kind of overcome that because that's you know, not so much a sport issue, but just a whole health and life issue in general. Yeah, it really bugged me around for yeah, the good 18 months of you, 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 I would sleep for 12, 13 hours and wake up and still feel tired and, uh, and have no energy. So at those days, I was, I was starting work at sort of 4.30, 5 o'clock uh, most mornings. You get home at 1 o'clock, you have a little snooze after after work and go to training at 5. And sometimes I would just I'd, I'd wake up, see the see the, uh, see the clock, and go. Nah, I'm too tired. I'll go back to sleep. Yeah. Wake up for dinner, and then go back to sleep, and and then uh, you start and work again. So, uh, for me at that stage, it was just basic surgery. So uh, I had to go to right. hospital, get all the tests done, all the um, all the cords and leads all over your uh, over your head, and I had my tonsils and uh, adenoids taken out um, for surgery, and um, that had helped it. 
Um, at that stage, as a nineteen-year-old, it's it's not recommended to be getting your tonsils and, and stuff done. But yeah, um, I just had to, and it, and it did change a, a fair bit. And I'm probably struggling with probably my sleep a little bit at the moment. When you you put on weight, you snore a little bit more, and I was horrendous <laughs> yeah. as, as a younger person. Um, snoring it probably probably wasn't helpful when you're single as well. That you're, if you're <laughs> trying to make the opposite sex, you are. Uh, you uh, bit of a deterrent. You're sleeping there and, <laughs> and, and you're snoring. It was not quite attractive. So, um, uh, yeah, I had to get that fixed. And, and it's still, uh, I've still got to be careful with it. And obviously, watching my diet and um, yeah, uh, not putting on too much weight uh, so it doesn't affect me too much um, in later life. So, you were drafted by the dogs at number 71. Did they know that yeah. you were going through those steps to get rid of the sleep apnea? <clears throat> it, it kind of almost reads like that they they knew you were going to slide a bit and they were happy to hold out until one of their later picks for you. Yeah. So I had a fair few meetings with the Bulldogs in um, 2001. So I jumped on board a, a guy, Brenton Hart, uh, which is Ben Hart's stepdad. Um, he was a player manager um, and he hung around West, uh, the Woodville West Torrens and around that area. So he, he, he grabbed me and pulled me aside and said, mate, please sign with me because um, I'm good mates with Scotty Clayton and, and the Bulldogs are still very interested. Um, and then that's when they found out more uh, about the sleep apnea, had some meetings with families and, and stuff like that. And yeah. um, <clears throat> end up having the surgery in, I think it was uh, August of, uh, of 2001 before the draft. So they said, make sure you get all these uh, this issue fixed up and, um, and attempt to try to uh, improve your VO2 max as quickly as possible and, uh, and get fit. Um, and they said to me I was going to go pick 50, uh, 54 at that stage, which the Bulldogs right. ended up getting uh, Brent Colbert. Um, but they they knew anyway that no one was uh, was going to pick me up and pick 71, so they were confident uh, I, would, I would still be there at that pick. Would have been a nervous moment, though, was it, when they didn't read you at that pick? <laughs> oh, we don't have the luxury. We didn't have the luxury oh, so you... that they, that yeah, they have now. It's all on TV and, and televised, all that. It was... Um, I Just heard on the radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I was at a, uh, a good friend's house, Jared Wright, who ended up getting drafted to the Brisbane Lions in 2001 as pick 35. So he, he went there as a midfielder. Um, so all the hoo-ha around the house was uh, was for him. And yeah, about an hour and a bit later, they go, Brian's just been drafted. And <laughs> I had not told anyone. So it, uh, it, was, it was a good night. It was only two, it was only two South Australians that were drafted in, in that year. I think um, Mark Jamer ended up going... Uh, in the rookie draft in, in right, 2001. Okay. And so you made your debut round 21, 2002 versus the Blues uh, in ironically what ended up being Terry Wallace's final game at the club after he was, I suppose, yeah. part of the, the reason getting you to the club in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember much about getting the call up for your debut game and how that went? I don't think stat-wise it was flash, but that, that's not important. It's how you crew no. So. no, No, you don't count your stats. Make your, your stats count. <laughs> I think it was only two or three touches I had in that game. But those were the days when I didn't come on until, I think, the third quarter. Uh, there was not many rotations. You, you didn't yeah. chop and change like they do now. So, yeah, I was, I was sitting there and thinking, I oh, get got me match payments, sitting there for the first half, not touching it, and got the family and, and friends in the crowd. You're thinking, oh, Jesus Christ, they're, they're wasting their time coming over <laughs> from Adelaide here to, to watch this performance. Um, but the lead-up, yeah, it was, it was hard. I, I started off in the, um, in the Werribee Reserves. Um, that year and uh, built up to the seniors. Uh, it probably wasn't my expectation to get a game in, in my first year and um, <clears throat> just improved a lot. I, I hadn't played fullback in, in junior footy. I played centre-half back uh, because of my high played ruck, centre-half forward, but never played fullback. So to come into the AFL system <clears throat> to learn a new position, it just took me a little yeah. while, uh, but yep. I was able to grab it and, and understand it pretty quickly. So... Um, yeah, Terry Wallace's last game. We didn't have really an inkling that that was going to happen. But um, unfortunately, yeah, you get your first game and then Peter Rode comes in as the interim coach for the last game and, and drops you. So well, fair to say, I, was, I was happy at one stage that I, I got a game, but then I was nervous and thinking, Jesus, the new, the new coach has already dropped me. Doesn't like you. Did it, have, no. did it have much of an impact on you as a young player and the playing group, the the whole Terry Wallace, Peter Rode sort of crossover and how that all played out? Uh, not at that stage, no. When, you, when you're young, um, there's probably more going on at the footy club at that stage um, and a little bit after with um, Campbell Rose, the CEO, coming at that stage and because the finances were, were nearly crippling the footy club that uh, most players yeah. over two or three years' experience had to take 15% pay cut. Um, so that probably, you probably understand why they probably went with a Peter Rode at that stage. 
You have a Terry Wallace that would have been on good money. Um, yeah. They couldn't go out and get a really good coach, you could say. Um, they had to get on the cheap. And unfortunately, with, with, with Peter, he was a great guy and he was our fitness, hit a fitness in 2001. But um, probably the senior coaching job probably just didn't suit him. We only, I think it only lasted a year and a half. And I think it was, yeah. That, yeah. yeah, and it was hard. You, you don't have the personnel yet. At that stage, Brisbane Lions were, were flying and, and their game plan was, let's just move the ball quick, get it in deep to, to Lynch and Brown and Bradshaw. And uh, Peter Ryde tried to copy that sort of game plan, but unfortunately we had Matthew Robbins as our full forward at that stage, so um, who's probably five foot two. So, You've got to have the uh, cuddle. <laughs> yeah, it's probably just the bad, just not the right time, uh, unfortunately, for Peter. And he's obviously had a very successful career before that and then after yeah. that at Port Adelaide as well in, in admin. And while you were predominantly a defender, you did hit the scoreboard yeah. along the way. Uh, first goals, you got three goals, mm. I think, on your, on your first time you kicked a goal against Frio in round seven, 2003. What was it yeah. like kicking your first AFL goal and then to go on and kick another two in the same game? Yeah, it was a little bit of shock. I, I, yeah, probably my first four or five games um, to get into the uh, into the team was to play as a forward. So uh, we still had Matthew Croft, Stephen Krediuk, um even Luke Penny was still playing at that stage of the Bulldogs in, in defence. Uh, so I was able to sneak up and, and kick a few in it. Um, yeah, it's great. You, and like anything, I was only on a one-year contract at that stage and uh, the yep. same for the, the following year. Just just those little milestones, you, your first game, you, your first goal, um, all those, you, you're ticking those little boxes. You, yeah, you'd love a little set shot, but I still picture it. I remember the, I think it might even been um, Rowan Smith kicked the ball in. There was a leading... Uh, player uh, from my team that um, went in front of me. I sort of slid behind that contest. Ball gone out the back. My players dropped off a little bit. I picked it up, turned around, right foot snap, and went through. I was probably a little bit of a shock, to be honest, still. <laughs> like you, you snap it, and you, and you look at like, oh, geez, I've just kicked the goal. What do yeah, I do? Celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, I did actually, I don't know why I did that. I did see that on YouTube just recently, too. I don't know why. I don't know why I Googled or YouTube my name for, but... Um, yeah, that did come up. My first goal for the Bulldogs and actually my last, which is which is weird why someone would put that up. <laughs> oh, people love the highlights. Yeah. Uh, Rocket E took, took over in 2005 and it, he's mm. obviously had a very, very big impact with the club straight away, winning 11 games yeah. in his first year. And you, I think you just missed the finals by two points. What changed yeah. for you and the club during that off-season to sort of get that close? And it, was, it felt like a drastic turnaround. <sighs> Yeah, it was, it was probably just that, uh, the belief. You, you have a coach that's um, coached at, at Sydney and took him to a um, to, took him to a grand final, so he, he knew what he was doing. Um, and yep. after those really hard years and uh, and the club struggling, for someone like him to come to the footy club, everyone was like, oh, this is, we're going places. And obviously the Bulldogs had invested heavily in the, in the draft in, in 2000 uh, when they got Robert Murphy and Jeer and uh, Ryan Hargrave and Mitch Hahn. And then even from, from my year as well, um, uh, they had Sam Powell pick 10 and then following on that. So we're getting a good core group of players there that have played some games together. So we understood that there was going to be natural improvement, but then with a the coach, with a game plan uh, to come in, we thought we could we could really improve very quickly. Uh, and that you did, because 2006 was a big year for the club. You finished yeah. eighth, you made the finals, so your first taste of finals. How exciting yeah. was that for you as a player and the club, given that where you would sort of come from those previous years and what you had been through? Yeah, I, I did a fair bit. I used to, um, I was doing a course in hospitality operations at the uh, the footy club in sort of 2002, three and four. So uh, we used to have a, um, a footy show called um, the, the Bulldogs footy show Thursday night, very similar to the, um, the one on Channel 9. So I used to work behind the bar and... Um, I was always mingling with with supporters uh, on on a constant basis, and you understood their their passion and and hunger for success. It had been so long since uh, since I had that in '54, and being so close in the '96 '97 era with with Terry Wallace, and then missing out that they had under they, they were used to that roller coaster of yeah they were being good, yeah. and then, then you know what we're going to have a bad period of five or six years here because we we'll have to go back to the draft, and it was just a a constant roller coaster compared to sides like a, a Sydney and a, and a Geelong that don't uh, bottom out. Fortunately, the Bulldog supporters always have that that roller coaster support. So yeah, um, roller coaster season. So yeah, you understood what they wanted and, and and how hungry they were for success. So to to finally get that in and and yourself like yeah, 
when you first start off your career, you're very selfish. You're just thinking about yourself. How how can I get yeah. into the team? How can I stay into the team? I just want to play my role. I don't care if I get four or five touches. I'm just going to lock down on my opponent. But then you evolve. You then you feel safe and and um, uh, secure in your position uh, as a, as a senior player. And then that's when you you, you change. And um, then that's when you want team success. That's when you you you're looking to help your teammates get better um because you you like anything you're more secure in, you, in yourself yeah. so um yeah being so close in that 05 season i still remember it we were sitting at the um at the lawn bowls uh i think it's the spots with lawn bowls um watching the last game i think it was against uh, i think melbourne was playing and we needed them to lose and and unfortunately um they ended up getting the chocolates in that game so yeah yeah <clears throat> And then the preseason completely changed. Uh, he yeah. he understood what our, our group was. We had a lot of light guys that could run and kick the football. So he uh, he implemented a game plan that one we've got to get fit. Everyone's got to get fit, but um, we're just going to move the ball quick. And um, we did that. Uh, unfortunately, probably early on in those sort of 07, 08 years, we probably needed a couple of uh, key forwards just to uh, clunk some marks up forward that we just didn't have. Um, unfortunately, but you yeah, look at those and I can teach people. We'll, we're so close. You definitely were. You made good use of the first <laughs> final, the elimination against Collingwood in front of 84,000 people. You smashed them by yeah. 41 points. And they were fifth, so you are probably going in as the underdog if you look at ladder positions. Uh, what were your memories of that game and what was the atmosphere like on the ground knocking off the pies by that much? Yeah, that was phenomenal. Yeah, you... you, um, yeah, you any time, obviously, at your home ground being at the stadium, there wasn't too many times you get to play on the MCG, so... Yeah, with the Collingwood faithful and uh, being a day game, most most finals you play now are at night. Um, so yeah, to, exactly. To play that, that that day elimination finals was phenomenal, and you still remember. And um, I think everyone remembers Brett Montgomery getting absolutely KO'd by Brody Holland um, in that year as well. So um, in that game, which was ironic because he was um, my coach last year as well. Brody. I was about to say, um, didn't you take over from him just recently? Yeah, I, so, I took, yeah, yeah, took over from him just yeah just recently, just. Um, in uh, November last year, so yeah, we, it was a, a few of the boys had mentioned it a few times to him about uh, <laughs> at Brett Montgomery hit, but for us to get over that game of just being able to get into the eight and then knocking off the fifth side by pretty comfortably too, yeah, he's, um, yep. but then coming up against West Coast over in Perth, um, we probably you, you look at it that was probably our grand final really, the yeah. um, that uh, that Collingwood game, so you go over there and it's just a free hit. Um, and we we ran out of steam. Uh, we probably celebrated a little bit too much. The supporters <laughs> probably knew that we probably weren't going to get the win over there uh, against uh, West Coast, who were flying at that stage. It seemed like it was a bit of a stepping stone, though, for you guys, because from 2008 to 2010, I think you made the prelim in each of those three years. Unfortunately, you lost to the Cats and the Saints twice. As a player in a club, yeah. how do you deal with those losses? I suppose year on year, year like that, so close to making the grand final. How do you how do you sort of cope with those losses? Yeah, it was hard. Um, y your first one, yeah, because you, you you just got there for the first time. You um, you just think it's going to happen again. Um, yeah, and the hurts probably not as there um, as it would be for the, the the second and third ones, which which eventuated. So. Um, yeah, you look at, I still can't remember who, in, in 08, it was St Kilda, was it, that we lost to? Or Geelong? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, where have I got it? Yes. The Saints, I reckon, uh, was it was Geelong? Cats in 08 and then St Kilda 09 and 10. Yeah, yeah. Bloody Saints got us twice. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, you look at it. And Hawthorne were flying in, in 2008. You, you give yourself an opportunity um, to go up against them in 08. would have been fantastic. But, yeah, it's probably... It's hard to, hard to really think about now what naturally a, a, as a team you you want to you want to try to improve and for us at that stage it was probably more personnel that needed to improve i think our game plan was okay yeah, we've probably come up against some really good sides of that in that era as well you um come yeah. against geelong that uh, probably couldn't string those two grand final uh wins together um but then you come up a against the st kilda that were flying there that just couldn't get the uh, the chocolates and then Obviously, Collingwood as well. That um, got some really good teams in, in that period of time, which was it's probably unfortunate for us. We were a really good side, but we just didn't have that. Um, as I said before, a couple of key key forwards would have been fantastic, and we got Barry Hall in, in the in the last one, two thousand and ten. But um, 
yeah, if we just had him maybe a year or two earlier, um, does that change things? And, and you look at it, you look at moments. So I know I had a moment just before half, just after half time, actually against Nick Revolt, and you give a free kick away, which they get a goal, gives them a little bit of a momentum. You look at missed opportunities um, in, in front of goal that we just didn't take. Mm-hmm. I think it was Will Minson and, and Sean Higgins uh, were, were a couple that are just at the top of my head that I can remember. But, yeah, I, it doesn't sit harshly with me because I've probably had some success afterwards. Yeah. Um, compare that to prep players that have played one grand final or the, and lost that, you probably sit on that a lot more. I was, luckily enough, to have some success afterwards has probably just taken my mind off those, off those bad ones. Bit of a side question because you mentioned Will Minson and it triggered someone who uh, had asked me a question to ask you. I don't know yeah, if it's yeah. true, but so I'm a Richmond supporter and he, this yeah, other yeah. Richmond supporter had mentioned that there was a game where <laughs> you had the mark and we got having a shot for goal and you maybe had a bit of a cramp and passed off and Minson who scored. Were you really injured or did you just... Did you did you, you oh, that, that was a good mark. That it was a game plan at that stage when sides were a goal or two up. Uh, late that they'd always put a um, a, a tall forward down in in defence as a loose man. So Rocket goes, you know what, Brian, you go even the numbers up as, as quickly as possible. So I'd go and, and go forward and try to get dangerous, um, which I was able to do against uh, uh, against sorry Richmond at that stage. And um, I thought I was a little bit further out. I thought it was forty five or fifty out. I thought, oh, I probably can't make this. So um, oh, <laughs> yeah, I thought, uh, yeah. I might just uh, might just go down here for a little while and just see what happens. Because <laughs> I, I didn't know Will Minson was there. I, I knew Scott Welsh was very close, and he was a he was a dead eye for uh, for goals, uh, Scott Welsh. But then I I saw the ball go to Will Minson. I'm thinking, oh, geez, should I go back? Should I go back and get this ball? No, I'm can't. right I'm now. I'm right. Committed. <laughs> I'm, I'm committed. I have to go. And then he then he's kicked the goal, and I've told to the trainer, no, I'm all right. I'll go back on. He goes, no, you can't. You can't. You've just gone off, um, and we've given the the, uh, the ball away. So. Um, yeah, there's probably it's probably a regret I've probably had in my footy career that you'd you'd like to take that moment back and and have the opportunity to um, to kick. kick no, it's not the winning goal; it was just the the goal to uh, to put us even. No, it's very good. I'm glad you. It's you got to do what you got to do sometimes, but uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's it was, it was within the rules. It, oh, absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, it always provides a good story and. <laughs> Richmond supporters, I don't get bugged about that too much. It's probably more the uh, the North Melbourne Drew Petrie that uh, people get into me about. Yes, yeah. I did have a question about that, but I won't. I won't oh, I, I preempted that, didn't I? No, yeah, you did. Uh, no, but I scrapped that one. Now, okay. 2012 would have to be one of the greatest sliding door moments for an individual player in recent yeah. history. <clears throat> um, you obviously made the move to the Hawks. How did that come about? I think Marty Pask was actually mentioned something the other month about a lot of midnight meetings yeah. um, with the club. So was it you sounding out the Hawks? How did it all sort of come down to it? Because it was an extraordinary move. Yeah. Uh, probably went back to 2011. Um, after the 2010 season with the Bulldogs, we pushed really hard late to, to finish in uh, the top four um, at that stage. So I hurt my knee. Yeah, I think it was around 20. I, I dislocated my kneecap and sliced some cartilage off. So it would blow up. So I'd have to drain it, get it drained on Monday, jab it up for uh, for the game. And I did that for five, six weeks and all through finals. So by the time I had surgery, the knee wasn't looking too good. So we didn't have that done. I had to have um, hip resurfacing done on, on my uh, right hip as well. So that was so the knee was sort of four or five month, or four month injury. Uh, hip was three months. So I had all those done and then obviously only been able to do weights and boxing. My shoulders started getting really sore after landing heavily. Tom Williams took me out in one of the finals and I've landed heavily on my shoulder. So we eventually we come back from pre-season, uh, from the uh, off-season into pre-season and I said, my, sh- my shoulder's still playing up. So we had that scan and then they go, no, nope, we need to get surgery on that as well. So that was another 12-week injury. So in that year, you have three lots of surgery um, in, in the off-season. So... At that stage, to try to get to back to playing football around three was just unrealistic. So, yeah, um, my performance dropped, um, and I, I got dropped down to the v, VFL. Uh, I think it was around six at that stage. So, what had happened? We were, we were struggling as a team, and it's amazing when your, your performance drops as well. That um, sort of players and and everyone else sort of turns on you as well. So, um, 
at that stage, I thought halfway through 2011, I thought my time at, at the footy club has probably expired. Um, relationships broken um, uh, at that stage. So I spoke to Marty halfway through that year and he goes, it's going to be pre- pre- probably pretty hard to, to move you on at the end of 2011 after only playing a handful of games and being dropped um, and the body's still not quite right. Um, he said, so he said, just have a massive pre-season at the start of 2012 um, and try to get back to playing some reasonably good football and, and we can look at it there. So he knew then at that stage, uh, end of 2011, that I wanted to, to, to look at another club. So he he uh, he worked his butt off through that 2012 season to, to try to find a club. I said, I, I want to go to a club that's in a premiership window. I don't want to move into state with the family and, and yeah. the kids for um, potentially could only be a couple of years. So it had to be a, a Melbourne side. So I think it was grand final grand final week. I went I went away on a, on a footy trip and uh, then a, a holiday with the, the wife at that stage. So come back grand final week and he said, we've got a meeting straight after the grand final on a Thursday with, with Hawthorne. So that was the first time I had had known of anything was was Grand Final Week. Wow! That uh, the only club that he spoke to was was Hawthorne. Okay, so just that was it. Spoke with the Hawks <clears throat> yeah. and got got the job done. Yeah, That's so phenomenal, isn't it? There was a little uh, probably Hawthorne supporters don't want to listen to it, but there was probably I went to the Grand Final. There's probably a little bit of me thinking, well, it'd probably be a good thing if Hawthorne lose this because it probably even emphasizes it more that they uh, they probably feel they feel they need there's a need. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hundred percent. So the deal gets done, and I think you you went and did a, a mini pre season essentially before the Hawks returned from from their off season. Was that something you decided to do yourself just to put your best foot forward, or is that a, a club in, a club decision? Um, well, after had my skin folds tested, um, I, I probably needed to get back into training <laughs> as, as quickly as possible. Not playing finals, we already had sort of four nearly five weeks off anyway, uh, or had at that stage. So. Uh, I said to him, "Let's let's just get uh, let's get going straight away and, and, and get this going." So it wasn't a five days, six days a week sort of pre-season. They, we just started from scratch um, and just pretty much just click the uh, the reset button on the body and, and the knee to uh, to get that right. So being able to do that at the start of October, I was able to get a good six weeks of leg strengthening in just to set yourself up um, for the pre-season uh, when that I started. You, when all the boys would that- come back. And you, I think you ended up missing the first few games, didn't you, with the corked leg? But the, the team was flying. I think you had 19 wins for the year, um, charged yeah. into the final series. What was it like being part of such, I suppose, a clinical and dominant <clears throat> season? And was it hard for you to adjust to a new system after playing, you know, a certain way at the Dogs for so long? Yeah. I'll, I'll answer the first. The, 2013, because of the hurt that they had in 2012, um, even though they... They probably weren't the outstanding side. They they really come home hard in in that year with some really good wins. Uh, Hawthorne that um, they still think it was a as a final, a grand final they should have won. So, two thousand thirteen, I I'll, I'll put the analogy. It was just like me jumping on the back of the peloton, um, and I was just enjoying the ride. I didn't didn't have to go out in the front. I just I just jumped on and, and enjoyed the ride really in that on that uh, two thousand thirteen year because of because of the hurt and the hunger that they wanted. Um, to, to have some redemption on yeah. on that grand final loss um, because it did hurt. Um, so for me, that year was, one, being able to fit in and um, meet, understand the new guys, understand how they play. But I probably struggled a little while and probably Clark, I probably struggled with me coming in as well. With, he was the one that would just love a, a big spoil like a Josh Gibson, just knock the ball out of, out of the bounds and, we can reset. Let's just get another stoppage, set the ground up, and we can go from there. So, with me coming in and being able to take those marks, like it, like anything, there's always going to be, yeah, you're going to have your good where I do take the mark, marks, but then sometimes there's going to be some soft drops and um, yep. there could be some look ins for, for opposition. So, there were some teething issues with that. Um, but also, going from the Bulldogs, where we weren't really big on team defense, it was very much one on one and okay. uh, even. From early days, where um, you stand on a, a Barry Hall or you stand on a, a Matthew Lloyd, you start on him from the first minute and you, and you finish on him um, at the end. So you get your ju- game judged on how many goals he kicks or how many possessions he gets in that game. Where that's what I was used to for twelve years of my career. Yeah. So then you go to a, a club that's just all about system based. So for me, being the uh, the deep pillar, so it didn't matter who it was. So if it was 
uh, say if it was, I'm just trying to think of the side at that stage. If it was Collingwood, um, so if it was uh, Jack Anthony that was playing deep, I would stand Jack Anthony. If it was Travis Cloak that was going at the centre forward, that would be Josh Gibson. So I would just take whoever's deepest. It might have been Scott Penelbury at that stage. So it was all system based. It wasn't on a particular person. So for me, it was still hard because then when the ball comes in close, you're still protecting an area where I'm used to just then locking on and, and trying to find my opponent yeah. as quickly as possible. So that took a little while and, and being 30, 31, I think at that stage, it's very hard then to change because you, like, you learn your tricks of your trade and the old saying, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And it, and it was like that, um, really hard, especially with a, a team that's done this for a fair few years. Uh, they understood and they probably got a little bit frustrated with it too, but when it did work and I understood and, and obviously not, I, I tried to buy in, but it's still the natural reaction is just to lock down in, in pressure situations. Yep. So when I was able to get that, it, um, it clicked and it made life a lot easier and I think, geez, I wish this zone was back in when I first started. It would have made, made a lot my life a lot easier against a guy like a, uh, Matthew Richardson or Nick Rewalt that will start in the goal square, the work up to the uh, the logos on the wing, and then run back. I would have saved myself. I would have saved myself a, a lot of hard work. I could have just stayed stayed in the goal square, and I would have been okay. Was it hard though swapping your mindset from you know, like you said, you could have been on a Travis cloak, and then you yeah. know, five minutes later, you're on a more nimble resting midfielder, for example. Yeah. Was it hard to adapt and change your game style to that, or did you just keep yeah. doing what you do best, no matter who it was that was down there? Um, I, I was very big on uh, who who would kick the ball inside fifty. So I'd, I'd look, work on stats on on um, and, and understand midfielder. So you, for Luke Power, for example, he'd always rule on his left foot. He was never a long kick on his on his left. So he'd always drop the ball 20, 30 meters uh, to people on the lead. So you'd understand that. So as soon as he gets possession of the ball, I'm already get trying to take front position of my, my opponent. So that wouldn't change if I was on a small or a tall. Um, so I'd, I'd study still opposition uh, players that could potentially play on. Um, and, and I'd probably normally just stay with the same sort of game plan. There's only probably a couple yeah. that you would change with um, with that as well. Like, a, say, Tom Hawkins, for example, we would like to play in front as much as possible. But for Tom, I would always have to stay behind him because if you watch him now, he loves plays playing in front of him because he's able then just to initiate body contact, protect the ball, drop behind, um, and mark the ball. So I try to then make him look around for me. I can then initiate body contact. So you, you learn those little tricks and um, understand the strengths of some players and change, but it didn't matter who I was on. I sometimes I have to be a little bit more careful about trying to go for marks. So there's a couple of times I even had to stand Eddie Betts. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I was, I was pretty, I was pretty still quick um, over the first sort of 10, 15 metres. So I was okay on those type of players because the ball's coming in long and we've got enough pressure on the on the ball carrier. I, yeah. I was okay with even with guys on the lead. I thought my closing my closing speed was one of my assets. Now that year you played in a, a cracking prelim against Geelong, one of the all-time great games with the Hawks yes. winning by five points after I think you were 20 points down at three-quarter time. If you can remember, yeah. what was Clarko's message at three-quarter time because that was an extraordinary turnaround? No, I could not tell you. what I can't even tell you what I said in my uh, my huddle at three quarter time last week, <laughs> the line, uh, something uh, ten years ago. But um, all I can remember, I was thinking I was I'm jinxed. I went twenty points yeah, out. Exactly, I've just yeah. come from the I've just come from the Bulldogs. We lost three prelims. We're down by twenty points uh, at a in, a in a prelim to the uh, the Hawks that we should win. I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm bad lucky. It must be it must be again. me. It yeah. can't happen again. Um, and it, it, it almost did with 30 seconds left. I think I saw footage. Travis Varco was straight yeah. into an open goal and Brad saw yeah. Dover cross him and did enough and he, to make, force the miss. Yeah, and he, and he sliced it. So um, even even grand final speeches, Clarko wasn't over the top on, let's just flick the game plan around and change things. He was he was very rigid and structured on, on how he wanted the game. All the playing was already done, so it was just reinforcing those points okay let's be a little bit more aggressive maybe with that ball movement as soon as we take possession let's look for the 45 as quickly as possible get the ball in motion but it wasn't it wasn't one of those like you, you watch movies as inspirational speech or anything like that they we knew in tough situations we put silk uh sean berger in the middle of the ground wherever we needed him um yeah he was the mr fix it um and 
luckily for us, he was able to fix that in the, in that last quarter. And even for the, the grand final against Frio, Clark, I just still <clears throat> kept the message pretty basic and simple and much of the same as you had the whole year. The only thing that really changed was probably me at three quarter time. He, he asked, and it was Luke Beveridge, that was the backline coach, was um, instructed me to be the, the loose man in defence in, in the last quarter. <clears throat> and I mentioned a couple of times ago, you, you sure you want me to be the, the loose man in defence? <laughs> and that's when uh, Luke Hodge just, with a few little swear words, just said, shut the hell up, Brian, and just listen to what you've been told. Just play loose man defence. <laughs> Well, that's what you've been trying to get out of me for the last 15 weeks is playing into a structure. Now you want me to be a loose man. Well, okay, I'll do that. I'm used to this. All right. I'll play my own game. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the only thing that I can still remember at three-quarter time in that uh, in the 2013 grand final. And it was a, a close game in terms of margin, but it, it kind of always felt like that um, you guys had a lot of control of, of that game. What did it feel like being out there on the ground, especially in those closing moments when you pretty much knew the game was won? Well, oh, you, you compare uh, 14 to 15 compared to 13, there was a lot more enjoyment in those two years, the 14 to 15 compared to 13. 13, you, you still felt nervous. Being new to the system of, of playing grand finals, you, you still had that thought of the unknown, really, that sh they could come back here. You look at the time, you're like, yeah, it's only it's only a couple of goals. You don't know what can happen. And they probably didn't take their opportunities. A little bit of a swirly breeze in that grand final. And they, they missed some opportunities early. Um, uh, Fremantle, where we were able to kick some, some goals early and just put that scoreboard pressure on. Um, they jumped us. In the third quarter, I was able to kick a couple of goals, but we knew they weren't a high-scoring side. Um, um, in, in those years with, with Ross Lyon, they weren't a 100-plus um, mm. point side. They were a very defensive, structured side. So the score that we were, we were able to put on, we thought, well, this, we should be okay with this. If we can keep get, if we can get to 70, 80 points here, we just don't know if they can score those sort of uh, type of goals to, to beat us. And, you really look at those games. Yeah, Sam Mitchell was was fantastic. He played a selfless role in, in that grand final as well. He he knew Ryan Crowley was, was going to tag him, so um, they were out of a um, a dominant ruckman in Sandland. So he went to Sandland's hit zone every single time just to to yeah. mark up and crowd that as much as possible because midfield st um, stoppages wasn't our strength. Um, we I think we we're bottom really of of clearances. But what we we're able to do when that ball cleared. We made sure it cleared at the stoppage and we'll set up behind the ball. So I might be positioned 30 metres away from um, from that stoppage, knowing the ball's going to get dumped from there. So I'm positioned myself in that in, in that uh, in that position. And then we can set up from there, um, which worked really well in that, in that game. Well, whatever you did and however you set up, you obviously played an absolute blinder of a game, uh, playing on mm. Zach Clark, Michael Walters, Chris Main, Pavlik. So mm. you're kind of all over the shot with who you, who you're playing on. Um, but the end result was you walk away the 2013 Norm mm. Smith medalist. Did you have an inkling you were half a chance to get it? And what was it like hearing your name read out and the boys getting around you on field? <laughs> yeah, people ask me, go, did, did you think you're going to win? I go, I, I feel confident. I, I think it was in the first quarter. I was, I was trailing my man. It was out in the wing. Um, I think it might have been Chris Mann at that stage. Or no, I think it might have been Pavlich. And I'm, I'm about five, ten metres off him. I'm thinking, oh, no, he's going to get possession here. The ball's... Literally landed. Well, there was only us two there on the wing. The ball's landed. It's gone, bounced, bounced over his head into my lap. I'm thinking, wow, I'm on here. This is, <laughs> you don't get this often. You're like, I'm trailing and the ball's just bounced over his head into my lap. Then I hit the target. I'm thinking, like anything in the start of the game, you want to be able to get your hands on the ball early and, and get a touch just to settle the nerves. Um, to get that one first up, you're like, oh, geez, I'm, I'm on here. And Feeling good, yeah. It's same, and that's what I was saying with with Sam Mitchell. Their ability, the midfielders, to make sure they dump that ball from stoppage. I was then able to position myself off that. Other defenders then working um, hard to to lock down their opponents to give me uh, free air to take those marks. Uh, made my life a lot easier as well. But yeah, yeah in game, it, especially the last quarter, when the hectic nature of it, it's. Um, yeah, hundred percent. You don't think about it, but um, not caring. Yeah, you thought. Yeah. yeah, your thought does compare that to fourteen and fifteen when we're fifty odd points up at three quarter time. You're looking around, you're thinking, "Oh, who's who's in who's in for a show here?" And I feel like <laughs> yeah. Hodges Hodges pushed himself down in defence to be a loose man in defence in the uh, last quarter against Sydney. You're thinking, 
All right, Hodgie trying to get uh, the Norm Smith here. <laughs> and then 215 was probably a toss of the coin against West Coast. Um, there was a lot of good players in, in that year. So, um, so yeah, Cyril was well-deserving. But um, probably yeah. my year, probably Jack Gunston. If Jack, Jack kicked one more goal, he might have he might have snuck he in. Might have got it. Yeah. Now, some of the, I'll, remind, some of the I'll, remind, I'll, I'll remind him too. He goes, I've stolen his Norm Smith. I go, mate, oh, yeah. one more. If you kick one <laughs> more, mate, you would have had it. Yeah. <laughs> Now, some of the best photos mm. to come from that game, post-game, were the Hawthorne players and all their families out in the ground celebrating mm. with the kids and whatnot. What was it like for you having the kids join you out there for that first grand final win? Yeah, they loved it. Yeah, the um, yeah, there's some good footage. I know there's one of my daughter where she's she's holding both fists and her eyes are closed and she's, she's that excited. Um, and there's another footage of um, when I went to the boundary line to, to get my son. He's running towards me with his... Arms out, went for a hug. You look at that, you're like, now I don't understand why all of a sudden they hate me. All of a sudden, they're 13 <laughs> years old, 15, they don't want to hug me anymore now. Completely changed. Plus, I don't play for football anymore. Maybe that's why. Um, but it, it is, and that's obviously Hawthorne being a family club, but um, being able to celebrate it with your family uh, on a day like that because you just don't know if it's ever going to happen again. You leave a footy club for success to. Um, to, yeah. to get that in your first year, one is relief, but you're like, well, you, your decision's vindicated then to um, to leave a football club that gave you an opportunity that sort of went out on, uh, on a limb there to to pick up at pick seventy one. You you felt a bit loyal to to stick with them, but unfortunately, I, perfect world, I would have and, and played a premiership with them, but uh, unfortunately I had to leave. And uh, they the kids they were, they were quick to to jump off the the bulldogs at that stage, and um, yeah, they absolutely loved it. They um they slept well that night, I must admit. Yeah, twenty fourteen was a bit of an up and down year. I suppose early mm. on, I think you only managed to play eight games due to injury and suspension. But I think most importantly yeah. is that you you were able to get back and play rounds twenty one, twenty two, and twenty three, mm. which sort of I suppose played yourself back into form and locked into yeah. the twenty two. Mm. Was it were you feeling because you hadn't played as many games during the year, injury aside, were you feeling a bit mm. fresher heading into that final series because of the, the lack of bashing and crashing? Yeah, we we'll missed the first three weeks through suspension from the from the grand final, so um, yeah, it was not ideal. But at that stage, they, they said, "Do you want to?" Well, I think it was Mad Monday. Do you want to appeal your your grand final suspension? And come on, you're, you're not going to be doing that on Mad Monday, are you? So no, no, I wouldn't. Have I, I had to take. I took the three weeks. I could have tried to appeal it. No, let's just take the three weeks. <laughs> worry about it later. And yeah, it was it, it was a tough year suspension. I, I had an issue with my knee as well. That was. Um, it was actually fluid um, that goes from your knee. It was tracking down to my calf. Um, and we didn't know, I was just getting a tight calf, but it was just filling up with fluid. And I tore my calf uh, reasonably badly um, from that. So one, the doctors had never seen that before. So to, to get on, on top of that, um, I think that was, it was against St. Kilda at the MCG. I did that. So I think that might've been right at the end of the year, uh, or middle of the year, sorry, as well, then the suspension. So yeah, I was feeling good. Um, the plan was at, at Hawthorne as well, and that's uh, uh, talks were was I wasn't going to be playing every game anyway. At, at my okay. age, that they wanted to try to manage me as, as much as possible. But um, um, it's hard when you're getting into games and other players aren't getting injured. That they're like, well, let's just keep this you going, okay? So I probably played more games in my first year than that they probably expected. So yeah, um, to have that year was was probably good. Um, that I was able to freshen up the body and yeah. and the mind um, going into finals, uh, which was needed. So, um, yeah, ideally, you would have loved to have played some more games. And you, you look at your career, you're like, oh, I didn't get suspended so much. If my injuries later on in the career, I was probably lucky early in my career that I had um, some continuity in footy. My injuries weren't too bad. I had I probably had more more suspensions um then then injuries uh games missed to be honest with you um but uh that's probably just me being a bit of a dickhead during uh, my football career <laughs> now that final series the prelim final for some <laughs> reason you guys had a, a bad habit of playing close prelims i was actually at this game because my wife's a hawthorne supporter and she couldn't watch mm -hmm. the last minute she was at the toilet with her cousin with her eyes closed but um <laughs> you had a 23 point lead and port were just throwing the kitchen sink <clears> at you in the last quarter and even the commentators said that it looked like you were out in your feet. How did it feel out yeah. there with Port having just that last-minute surge to try and overcome the margin? 
Yeah, and that's how that's how they played all year. They they played like that, really aggressive. And the hardest thing, I've, I've got a stepson. He's he's twenty two, and um, he's a mad port supporter. So it was a, it was a very quiet um, drive into the game as well. And fair to say, it was a very quiet <laughs> drive home as well because either way, he would have he would have had to walk home um, if they had won. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it was. It was nerve wracking, and and what the, you're talking about the commentators saying we're out in our feet. Well, we definitely were, but we could with the avalanche that was happening. We it was very hard to stop. That they, they had their wingmen um, just bolting in from the back of the square. Or sorry, half half backs bolting from the back of the square. Um, it was just an avalanche, and it, it just it's very hard to stop momentum. You see that in football now. Mm, yeah, sides with the six 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 rule. Um, it is very hard to stop, and. It, putting that into a prelim when you got a side that's got nothing to lose compared to a side that's, well, we can't lose this. We shouldn't lose yep. this. Um, you said the, the nerves, uh, the nerves kick in it's probably more recently, just with Melbourne and, and Brisbane game that probably Biz, Brisbane probably put the, uh, the queue in the rack a little bit too early. Um, and Melbourne's just gone bang, bang, bang. Um, and it, it is very hard and we're very lucky. There's some, you look at some moments, I, I probably could have got done holding the ball in the last sort of five seconds after funny I dived to Funny you mark. say that. I've got footage of, yeah. uh, of the last minute. that I, We talk about oh. moments. Uh, okay. Yourself and Luke Hodge had some unbelievable yeah. moments. So I'll pop this up on the screen. Here. Yeah. Right. Have a look at the one-on-one matchups. Burgoyne pumps it long and wide. Mark Ebert. He doesn't waste any time. Hodge with a smother. Hodge. Mm. Oh, look at Jonas go in. What a smother from Luke Hodge. I reckon Jones is a bit stiffy for holding the ball this oh, time, but we'll take it. Ball. Yeah. That replay there of Luke Hodge, the captain. He might have just got his team into a grand final with that second effort. Harsh call. He gets it to Mitchell. They might just be able to hold on here, Hawthorne. Yeah, he could have hit the 45 there, here. Sam Mitchell, but the man like on anything, nerves. Point, he's free. Yeah, yeah. He goes long down the line. Any risks than going near goal, though. At this stage, I had to let Jay Schultz in the middle of the ground go because they had a loose number in the 450, which was uh, Monfries. Yeah, exactly. Hartlett. So I had to concede this one. They have. Schultz can kick it inside. And then you just me about on this guy. Yeah. Monfries and Lake, Lake and oh. Monfries. Which I can understand why the umpire didn't pay that. Five seconds, two seconds. Gonna... Oh, that's oh, it, and that is, and that is game. So two, yeah, no. two clutch <laughs> moments there from yourself <laughs> and Hodgie. Well, Sam, he, well, Sam's a very good kick. He could have hit that 45 and just oh, retained possession a little bit more. But And, and also our tall forwards, really, down the line there. Um, Carlisle taking a mark. If we could put some pressure on there, the, the game is over. So I didn't want to have that last moment. To be honest, I should have probably took, taken that mark. Um, you had the size on uh, Monfries, didn't you? you yeah, Monfries, yeah. Nicely. I just, just tapped it, but I just, just couldn't get that little bit extra there. And re- I think, was it, f- that was on the 50 mark, so probably 52. By the time Monfries took that kick, I don't know if he would have made a distance anyway. Yeah, I reckon he might have been just just beyond his range. Mm. So I reckon yeah. you were pretty safe there. But yeah. a great moment for you uh, to hold on and get the win, heading into your second grand final in as many years, which is just crazy. Yeah. Um, but this time against Buddy Franklin, obviously made the move to the Swans mm. in the offseason. They've got Sam Reed, Kurt Tippett. So we've got some big units down there for, for you guys to have to take care of. Was your, what was your preparation like going into that game, you know, with their type of forward setup, with how big they were? Yeah. And was there any? made of the the franklin situation or did it was it just business as usual it was a, a sydney mentality rather than a buddy mentality yeah no it wasn't nothing was really spoken about bud but the the sydney thing was was mentioned it wasn't it wasn't done during the year it wasn't done at the start of um grand final week but it was done in the last the last meeting which was on, on the friday um and they showed um uh, the video guy showed a, a clip it or snippet sorry of about a minute uh, about a minute two minutes of highlights from the 2012 grand final um and nothing else was said they just just showed that of, of the heartache of um <clears throat> on on players faces the, the celebration from the uh, sydney swans players and then nothing else was said um after that they just showed that which was which, which which put put goosebumps on on 
Oh, yeah, definitely. And me not even playing in it. It was just, um, yeah, moments like that. When they did videos like that, if or even when Clarko um, got his guitar out and, and sang songs, uh, they just had the ability to find the right moment um, yep. to put those in. And just the video that they did um, about redemption against Sydney Swans, you probably noticed that in the first sort of 15 minutes in that first quarter, how we were able just to hit them that hard and, Probably the moment that sticks in my mind still is is Ruffy's hit on Hanbury. It was probably one that sort of typifies um, that aggression and that hunger to to get redemption. I actually had that exact pretty much question written out next. Like from the outside looking in, it <coughs> definitely looked like that you guys were playing a much more physical game. And I've got written down Rough Head Crunch Hanbury in the first quarter. You landed on Buddy, yeah. made him earn it. He got up sore, and it just. Yeah. On the, from the outside, it felt like that was a real focus of just cracking in 100 mile an hour mm. to let him know that this is not going to be an easy day yeah. for him. And, and that's when me being a coach, you, know, you, you try to tell to the younger guys about um, about setting the scene or even your leader setting the scene, uh, making your, your your first contest really count in, in, in the game. And that, that is the evidence that you, if you want to show a, a side or a young person um, about setting the scene and, and making the impact with your with your first touch or your, your first contest, those highlights. I think there was even uh, Bradley Hill. There was a big tackle uh, out in the wing as well um, in front of the uh, Shane Warne stand uh, as well. So just those little moments, and then if you, you look at opportunities of taken by by kicking goals, uh, Langford kicking a couple of goals as well. Luke Bruce, um, just making your moments count, and and the boys definitely did that in the first quarter. And it, it continued on because you were 54 points up at three-quarter time. The game's well and truly done. How different was the last quarter and a bit of, of that game versus 2013? Was, were you all able just to soak it in a lot more and actually enjoy the moment for what it was? Yeah, yeah. It, it, um, you look at those moments and you, you look at the first the first one, there's that relief when that siren went um, compared to, to th 2014 where you can look in the crowd when – Someone's the goal. You can look at each all your, your teammates and understand that the game's over, but you can just enjoy it a little bit more. And um, yeah, the tempo goes out of the game a little bit. You can you can feel the deflation in the in the opposition as well. That the, the ability to defend is just not quite there. So we're able to retain yeah. the ball a little bit more and 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 enjoy it. And um, yeah, yeah. I know supporters would love games to be always close and and. Um, the suspense of it, but to be able to enjoy, you, you enjoy grand finals afterwards, 100% you enjoy it for, for a couple of weeks and, and years to, to go on as well, um, and get to enjoy it this year, 2013 uh, reunion, but to be able to enjoy a grand final, knowing that you're going to win and been able to enjoy that for 25 or 30 minutes out there was was very special. Very Pretty special. Pretty incredible, and, um, whole different feeling. Yeah, you, you probably can't re really remember after the grand final because of the craziness and <laughs> uh, probably a few carton drafts, but you remember those highlights in, um, during the game. And now 2015 rolls around. Did you know early on that was going to be your final <clears throat> year? Or was that something that didn't really come to mind until later on? Uh, I had an inkling because um, halfway through the year, I, I hit up Marty Pass again. I go, oh, do you reckon we could push for maybe a, another year contract? Um, and he goes, oh, the club just said, let's just, just wait to the, to the end of the year and, and see how it goes. So... You sort of knew then. You're like, yeah, I'm, um, I'm struggling here. <laughs> they, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they might be, might be shipping me on here. Um, so I thought I still had a, a reasonably good grand final in 2015. So he's like, oh, yeah, maybe you, you never know. Um, but in saying that, you, you, I made sure that I, I enjoyed the the grand final uh, a little bit more in the celebrations on the ground. If it was getting in the Gatorade truck with the kids and <laughs> hanging out there a little bit more and just soaking it in because I, you sort of know, I, I knew at that stage, I thought this was, was probably going to be my last game, uh, which is a very good game to, to finish oh, off on. But uh, yeah, I just made sure I just took those moments uh, and, and enjoyed them a little bit longer than I, than I normally would. And that final series, I suppose, panned out a little bit different at the start with the, the loss first up against the Eagles over yeah. in Perth. How was that sort of dealt with? From because you know you guys hadn't really lost in the finals. You were just going you know bang 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 all the way through, and then to have to yeah. go back to Perth against Frio for the prelim. Were there any sort yeah. of worried feelings or nervousness about heading back to Perth to try and get into the grand final again? Well, it was addressed pretty quickly because um, 
I know it's it's little things and um, marginal gains, and uh, the boys did that in 2013 on how can we improve and get better, and they had these marginal gains. So if it's interstate trips, they wanted to win more of those. They wanted to goal kick in accuracy, so they understood that we've got to bring the ball into the, the corridor a little bit more inside 50. So there was this all these little uh, improvements um, <clears throat> that they wanted to make uh, throughout that time, and it was it was very similar in... in um, and that year, I forgot your question actually, to be honest with you. I'm, um, oh, just was there any nerves going having to go back over to Perth to try and get into yeah, the game? So yeah, and, 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 what, and what happened with the um, the travel was a few guys got upgraded to to uh to business class and uh, were taking Snapchats and and posting <laughs> photos of them all on the the uh, the front of the bus with uh, front of the plane with Virgin. Um, so then we had the loss. So then Clarko's came in, um, in the review on the Monday and Hit everyone between the eyes. Oh, we're treating this like a bloody, like a holiday. We're all sitting at the front of the plane, enjoying food, taking photos, singing it's a freaking holiday. This is freaking serious. We're we're here to be. We should have been over there freaking playing a game of football, not worrying about what seat we're on the plane on. So we're just like, whoa, okay. So fair to say that when we had to go back to Perth, there wasn't too many people sitting at the front of the plane uh, <laughs> on, the, on that trip. Um, luckily for me, that was my two fifty, so I I went on a, on a different flight. I went over a little bit earlier um, with the family, so I was still sitting at the front of the plane, so that was okay. Um, <laughs> but it was just those little things. It's just like is it minute, but it was just maybe a little bit of a mindset, and that um, that it wasn't just going to happen again. So obviously, we're going down the hard track here, but. We had the hard track in 2014 as well with Clarko being sick, with some guys getting injured as well. That it wasn't ideal 2014. So we were able to to do it probably the hard way as well. We'll the outsiders against Fremantle because they had an easy win there prelim. Yeah. We were the outsiders against um, against um, uh, Sydney in the 2014 grand final because they had an easy win over North Melbourne. So um, we knew we, we had a good game plan. We understood that... that what we could achieve here being a three-time premiership team of three in a row is um, something that Hawthorne as a football club hasn't done. There's only been a couple of clubs that have done it. So we could be on something very specially. So let's just not just piss this up on the wind here and let's yeah. get uh, let's get serious and knuckle down. So, um, yeah, it wasn't ideal. Then going over to Fremantle again, um, they probably had some... Um, some nightmares about the 2013 grand final still and um, we were able just to click and, and um, click in the gear in, in that game and, and get the chocolates. And it carried on to the grand final as well because it, it really did sort of feel like you had a lot of control on that game pretty early on. Did it feel that way to you being out there? Yeah, well, it wasn't everything wasn't ideal either because it was, it was the hottest grand final thing on record as well, the um, yeah. 2015. So you look at that and you think, well, Probably suits a, a West Coast Eagles. They've just knocked us off in the uh, in the first final as well. So everything's gearing to to West Coast winning this. It, everything just looks perfect for them. Um, but then, like we did against Sydney, been able just to set the scene and and it's so crucial being able to kick your goals early in games. I, I know they kicked the first goal. I think it was Luke Shuey kicking the first goal of the game in 2015. But everything we did was just seemed clinical. Um, in, in that grand final, we were able to put them to sleep really early. We we probably went harder with our rotations. We were probably lucky that we were able to get such a, a good lead. I remember going on the bench and we were limited to a certain amount of rotations. So I think we went through, uh, I think, 60 to 70% of our rotations or 65% of our rotations in the first half because we just wanted right. to tip those legs over. So, yes, it was probably going to be a little bit harder later in the, uh, in the game with rotations, but... We were able to set ourselves up reasonably well in that first half. Yeah, was, you had a pretty good crucial. Mm. Did you have a good view of Luke Hodges' goal? That was ridiculous. That was just no, I, yeah, I know. I was sitting, I was standing, I think, sent half back about 100 odd metres away. And then, obviously, the crowd, you still remember that it's just the atmosphere of, of when he does kick it. And then you look up on the uh, on the big screen just to watch a review and you have a little giggle to yourself and your, um, your defenders come in and, and have a chat quickly and you're just like looking at each other like, Really, um, and that's a feeling you get when you when you kick those goals. And um, Will Langford kicked a couple of those against uh, Sydney as well. Kicked, kicked a couple from the boundary. So yeah, yeah. So you're like, you look at that. You're like, yeah, everything's just working for us. Um, 
compare that to a Fremantle that missed your first three or four shots on goal, it is very deflating uh, as a team when you think, oh, things aren't just quite clicking for us today. But on the flip side, when uh, when we're kicking goals and boundaries like that, you're like, yep, yeah, we're on here. We're definitely on. Speaking of things just working, I've got another bit of footage here. You getting hand on this ball defies oh, logic. <laughs> McGovern is the target. He used a lot of strength there, held his position. If Josh Hill streaming's open goal, goal. Would, mm. No, I wouldn't. Oh, there. <laughs> what a terrible compromise. Yeah. Fuck, like I was loving my feelings. Love that. The coach would love that playing the game right to the very end. X team. <laughs> How I'll probably you went get against, yourself into a spot to yeah, do that. <laughs> I probably went against team rules, and that's if you, there was more footage of Clarko. Clarko is yelling, "Why isn't he pushing up? Why isn't he pushing up?" Because there, you meant to get the front off pressure, and then just hopefully that you've got some, you put some delay on, and then your uh, offside yeah. help. There's some guys coming to the goal square there, but I knew there was nothing around, so I thought I'll, I'm just going to tease him. I'm just going to try to tease him to come at me. Then I'll make that. I'm going to go at him. And it, like anything, it's just pure luck. I just teased him like anything. There's enough space here. You could just lower it. You don't want to be kicking it too high when you're on the run like that and snapping yep. it. But I just give him a look. Hopefully, he just kicks this low. And I thought, yep, I can see him about to do the ball drop, just launch. And it was just it's able like to touch goalkeeper it. goalkeeper dive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. I, I don't know why they didn't pick me for the Australian rules, for the, um, exactly. the garlic footy. Yeah, move oh, over Dustin I'll probably, Fletcher. You would have oh, no, I miss, missed my opportunity. Did, uh, but, did you uh, give him a bit of lip service after that one? Let him know that... I, I couldn't. I, 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 all, all I remember was going up and going, bang. and Because I, I was that fatigued and bugging him. <laughs> I don't know what to say. He, he, uh, Josh might have said some uh, explicit words at that stage. Something like, F you, Brian. <laughs> uh, but I, I couldn't say much. So I, was, I was obviously bugging and a, little bit shocked, and a little bit shocked as well. Soon after that moment, history was made. You won the third, the third flag in a row, which is yeah, incredible. Yeah. Um, did the the third one feel any different to the first? It was a, a greater sense of accomplishment, given that no one's really, you know, you don't really see three in a row these days. Yeah, and that's and that was probably the the talk through the week um, that we're on on um, got the ability here to do something that no one has done at the Hawthorn Footy Club that uh, we had. Um, uh, Jason Dunstall talking about their their um, two peats as well that they went back to back, but to be able to go back to back to back uh, at the Hawthorne Footy Club with the success that they've had that they haven't been able to do that before um, puts us in rare air and and up against sides that have done it previously as well and, and most recently uh, Brisbane Lions as well. So yeah, you look at I know. You're a Richmond supporter. They didn't quite able to get three. three. Oh, they got three, but not in a row. Three in a row is no. not easy. Oh. And, and you and you look at um, and, and you look at Geelong as well. That they weren't able to do that. You oh yeah. seven oh nine, and in two thousand eleven, that um, what Hawthorne learned from two thousand and their eight grand final that they probably took some things for granted in, in two thousand nine and missed the final. So for them to to experience that. And then not have any success until 2013. They were very conscious and um, was probably very hard on guys in 2014, knowing that they just didn't want to have that uh, mm. that grand final hangover. Now, the one thing that always amused me during this golden period of football for Hawthorne <clears throat> was that Richmond would often knock you off, and we weren't playing that well. We weren't that great, but for some very yeah. strange reason, we mm. just seemed to match up reasonably well against you. I don't know if it was the dim reversed Clarko factor. Don't know what it was, but was that ever spoken about, or was there ever a reason why that would happen? Like a lower <laughs> team like we were would, would yeah, it just never made sense. No, and it's just sometimes just certain game plans that just don't, doesn't suit how you like to play as well. I think at that stage uh, Richmond would hold on to the ball a little bit more and. Um, try to pinpoint and go through our, our zone. So um, we were able, we weren't able to defend that too well compared to to other sides. So um, yeah, we wasn't too sure, but we also had um, uh, the Kennett's curse as well at, at my time at, at Hawthorne. Yeah. So um, fair to say, a lot of lot of um, thought went into into those issues as well. So um, which we, <clears throat> it's amazing when you have those, and, and that's what what happened in that period of time. I'm like, well, why are they keep beating us? What What's going on is because of the pressure of losing five or six in a row against a side like that, 
you go like it's just a normal reaction. Everyone wants to go harder at the ball, harder at the ball. Um, yeah. We're going to win this. We're going to win this contest. So what was happening? Three or four guys were going into the stoppage and then trying to win that contest of the ball. But all all Geelong did was have one person one person go on the ball carrier, and then had had an outer ring circle of, of of other players. So they'd win the ball, have get their feet out where three or four of us would go at the ball, and they had out numbers out outside the contest. So we're like, okay, we're just going to get better balance here around around stoppage. Let's just not go crazy at the ball carrier. Probably worked in our favour then with how we played that we would always lose stoppage, but we'd always be better set up around the ground. But against Geelong, everyone was just like, no, nah, like we'll lose our structure. We're just going to go at this ball and we're just going to see if we can go harder at them, um, harder than them at the ball. But that wasn't working for us at that stage. So we just tinkered a little, few little things. And then Sean Burgoyne turns it on for one quarter and we're able to break the Kennet curse. He's unbelievable, Sean Burgoyne. Yeah, crazy. Uh, so not long after the grand final, you obviously announced your retirement. From there, what did you get up to in, in life post-footy? I started pre-season straight away at, uh, at Carolina Springs. Um, really? So you just went, uh, you finished up Hawthorne and then straight down there? Oh, it was probably a few months. So I'll probably let myself not go too crazy because, um, yeah, getting into and committing, we were in Div 2 at that stage at the footy club and had, they knew I was going to come back down there and play for them. But I did make them nervous though because that was the issues with um, Essendon at that stage when they lost all the the uh, the drug saga. Oh, yeah. that, um, <laughs> I actually got a phone call from Essendon. I think it was just after, just after New Year's in in 2016. Um, it was my manager asking if I was interested in in being a replacement player for him. Um, and literally had done two months or six weeks of pre season with Caroline Springs, and I was actually hung over when my manager rang me. I was at the, the caravan park. We had a, ca- a caravan site, uh, a, a um, cabin down at uh, Colindina Caravan Park. And I was I was literally hung over. We had a big night the night before, and I went to the uh, the canteen and got a can of coconut sugar and a uh, sausage roll. And I was literally <laughs> eating a sausage roll when he said, "Would you like to play for us?" And I thought, "Let just let me sit on this for half an hour and and let me think about it." And I went back to him. I thought no, it was actually a sort of five minute conversation, a uh, five minute break. Sorry, and then rang him up and said, "No, nah, I'm not into this." Um, yeah. I'm happy to finish my career. <laughs> I'm already enjoying myself. Already committed at um, Caroline Springs um, Footy Club, and the the way I'd left um, football, I feel football was, was winning a premiership. Um, I just didn't think I could see myself playing for a side that really struggled. Um, mm. And knowing that if I didn't, I hadn't. I'm not starting pre season until probably middle of January. Knowing what I went through in 2011 with three surgeries in that year, how hard it is, um, and you can't play after football behind the eight ball. If you don't have a good preseason, you'll see it even more now. Yeah, the start of the the first half of the year, you you're non-existent really. So um, it is that crucial to get a good preseason. So I said, no, this isn't too hard basket. Um, this is not for me. Oh, you know, it was old. That's well and truly the right call to to have to yeah. change your mindset back into doing the rigors of a proper AFL preseason. <laughs> Uh, no, I think that was, and like you said, going out on that kind of high note, you can't yeah. beat that. You don't want to tarnish yeah. that. That was yeah, as good as it can so, get. So, so it's still a good call about the sausage roll. You wouldn't be a, you're a pie man or a sausage roll man. Oh, the, the the frozen the frozen sausage rolls from like Safeway, are no good. But bakery ones are pretty good. Like canteen yeah. ones, I think that I think that's a good call. Yeah. Okay. With tomato sauce. Yeah, I think so. Actually, yeah, on tomato okay. sauce, yeah. fridge fridge or cupboard for tomato sauce. No, nah, I'm a cupboard. Covered? I'm okay. a covered person, yeah. Sorry. Um, in 2018, you had a few people asking, make sure we spoke about this, about you went on Australian Survivor, which was great yeah, to see yeah. you on there in Champions yeah. versus Contenders, and you did an amazing job finishing third, um, yeah. just falling short of the final two. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that, actually. Um, and it's a really good way to lose weight. I... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I um, I packed the I packed the weight on beforehand. I ended up weighing 119 kilos and spent uh, was it 49 days there, so seven weeks, and I ended up losing 19 kilos. So I ended up being 100 kilo, and it's weird in that because they before big challenge well, for your immunity challenges, um, they do a medical test, uh, uh, medical checkup on you. So they have a doctor and they weigh you. So you're not allowed to look at the scales. You got to look away while they do all that just to oh, monitor okay. you. 
Uh, and then the producer would, would come up and I think it was about two and a bit weeks in it. And they'd say, Brian, you're losing too much weight. You've got to start eating some more food. And I'm looking at them. I'm like, you give us rice and beans. How can I be eating more food? What, can, you, can you get my phone so I can just call Uber Eats so I can get a pizza? <laughs> how, can I get, how can I eat more food? Um, but, yeah, it was great. And for me, like, at that stage, it's just amazing how much we complicate life. Um, when you've got no phones, no TV, no stresses of work, all you're thinking about is a game. You, uh, you wake up when the sun rises. You, you go to bed when the sun sets. Um, it takes a little while for the your body to get used to it, sleep on, on the hard ground, um, detoxing while the, the, um, the caffeine comes out of you because you, use, you, yeah. you have your coffee every day to get used to that. Um, drinking water and rice where you used to, if you drink a soft drink or something like that, just to be able to cleanse the body um, was, re- was really good and really cleansing. And so, uh, I actually had an opportunity to do it again last year. Um, oh, okay. With the heroes versus villains, they asked me to do it again, but... Unfortunately, um, we were nine, I think 10 and zip at the moment at that stage in, in local footy and um, pressing for finals and potentially a grand final for the first time in our history of the footy club in, in Div 1. I thought <coughs> selfish, selfishly that, uh, or selfishly, it probably wouldn't be great for me to, to leave the footy club at that stage and, um, and go and survive. So I said no, which we end up... Uh, Going out in straight sets in the ground in the uh, in the oh, finals shit. anyway. So I'm thinking, shit, I probably could have gone to the gone, survivor yeah. then if, if we knew that. But then I thought, well, if we if I left and did survivor and I went we went out in straight sets, I probably would have blamed myself, saying, oh, if I was there, exactly. I could have it's a lose so, lose for you, yeah, yeah, it's a lose lose. So fingers crossed. Um, hopefully, they give me another call and I, I get another opportunity. I read somebody in the chat, Cristiano, wanting to know yeah. that if Sean had have taken you to the final two, which he should have, how confident were you to gather five votes for the win? I think I was speaking to people and, and afterwards that uh, I think I had enough votes. Um, I had made a good relationships with the um, with the contenders and um, also with Monica and um, uh, Shani and, and Fenella that um, I think I, I would have had enough votes. Yeah, I think it would have been still... I think I would have won by one vote. Jesus. I know yeah, it hurts. I know that's, it that's, hurts. That's, that's but what, what makes me feel better is Sean lost twice. So that, that makes me feel <laughs> even better. Because you were winning a lot of the individual immunities towards the end there as well. I think you won four, a couple of la- later yeah. ones, but not the last yeah. one, which is obviously the one you need the most. But how challenging, I mean, your physical game, you're always going to be fine because just with the competitive nature yeah. of who you are. But how was the social game? Was that a challenging aspect as well? Because you've got so many conversations going on. You've got lies. You've got all kinds of shit happening and trying yeah. to pick out what's real and what's not. Yeah, that's that's hard. But, yeah, you, you, you build good relationships and try to get those people that you like and that you can trust and, and have faith. And then you just find triggers that um, if they start acting a little bit differently um, from what you've been able to see in the, la- in the first sort of, two weeks or three weeks that you've met them um if there's any differences yeah you, you keep an eye on if they're having conversations um as well but um yeah i, I found that the social side of it not too bad i understood the game that and then at the end that the the last challenge is always demanding and it probably doesn't suit a six foot five a hundred and probably one kilo person at that stage up against a a, a girl sham that's She's a marathon runner. Uh, yeah. She probably would have been maybe just on 50 kilos at that stage. So being double the weight, I knew and looked at all the challenges through Survivor. It's always a very demanding one. So preferably you'd like to take a couple of people there that probably you're reasonably confident that you could beat. And I wanted to take Monica. I was happy with, with Shane at that stage to go to the final three with because I thought I, I could potentially beat these guys in, in the last challenge. But unfortunately, I couldn't beat Shane. So I... And like anything, you you dissect it and you think, oh, I did make some mistakes <laughs> through uh, through the stage, um, which is like, Jesus Christ, why do I do that for? And you stuff this up, you stuff that up. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, Hopefully you get another crack at it. Was, yeah, it was, it was fantastic, I must admit. It, yeah, challenging. We're lucky that there wasn't, wasn't much rain. I think we're only affected one night by rain. 
Um, I couldn't I couldn't handle it. It was two or three days of oh, drenching silly. rain where you get no fire and, and then you can't sleep properly. That would have been horrific, but we were very blessed in, in those 49 days. We were only really affected one and so night they really, with the rain. And they, so they really don't give you any additional help or comfort items to, you know, offer to help get you through. It is literally, it is what it is. You've got to just fend for yourself. But That's it. Just, it, obviously. Yeah, just, no, dog eat dog. Yeah, it's, uh, it is relentless. We're lucky. We, we have won a lot of challenges. So we're able to win a hammock, which we end up just turning into a blanket anyway. We're, we're able to win pillows and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one of the biggest ones was I was worried about my storing at that stage too. But um, Matthew Rogers took the cake with that. My God, people wanted to vote him out just because he's blatant snoring. It was horrendous. <laughs> so you had to stick those guys down at the end. You can't have them in the middle. We sleep in a straight yeah. row. But uh, I must admit, well, the first time, like, like anything, you're nervous. I'm like, I don't know how to build fire. I don't know how to do all this sort of stuff. I don't, I don't do that. But then when you see Commando Steve sitting there and you're like, Okay, we're safe here. I'm pretty confident that <laughs> we're going to be okay here with our campsite. I reckon he can make fire. I reckon he knows what to do with you. I'll just go pick up some logs, bring them back, and he can do the rest. <laughs> yeah. You just tell me what to do, and I'll do it for you, mate. All right. I'll do a couple of questions from viewers, and then we'll wrap yeah. it up. Uh, Aiden no, wanted no. to know, do you think that Leon Cameron deserves another crack as coach, and how was your experience with him as an assistant at the Dogs? Yeah, it's, it's hard now. with um, Coach or coaches have coached before. Unless you've had success, it's very rare for them really to come back in. Now, the, I know you look at the Gold Coast, they, they want a premiership coach. They just don't want any coach. They want, obviously, uh, potentially um, Damien Hardwick. So they want that. Or you look at the other sides now that they were happy if it's Richmond to go with a, a first year coach. Mm. Um, that they bring in different ideas, have got different relationships and different thoughts. And you look at Craig McRae, probably a perfect example that um, he's come in and just changed the, the landscape of, of that football club, the way they play and, and how they approach things. So um, Leon's been in the, yeah, in the system for a, a very long period of time. He was one of our my, my backline coaches uh, at the Bulldogs in, in the early days. So um, yeah, to see him grow, did I think he was going to be a senior coach when I first, uh, first met him? Probably not, but um, over time, he, they grow and, and, and change and probably say that about Adam Muse and I had Luke Beveridge for a year as well um, at the Bulldogs. I didn't probably see him as a senior coach and, and even Chris Fagan. Chris Fagan at that stage, um, he wasn't in, in the coaching area. He was up upstairs in the, in the admin part of it. So, yeah, yeah, it's hard. But yeah, for Leon, it would be another fantastic assistant coach. But I just think with the game, at least you've had success and the ultimate success of the coach now, which is which is vital if you want to get another senior gig. Um, yeah, I think might, his time might have passed him. Uh, from Min, I think it's more in relation to Survivor, but after living a certain lifestyle <coughs> with normal routines like your coffee, like you said, social media yeah. and things like that, how long did it take you to get back to your old routine? No, it did take a long time. I, um, even it was uh, three weeks in, we, we won a... Um, we won a challenge where we had um, uh, like an iced coffee um, yep. in that challenge. So I had one and there was another spare one left over. So I drank that as well. And I got crook as a dog. I had to go into the water and stick my fingers in my throat and bring it back up. Because I really? didn't have yeah. milk and the caffeine just hit me straight away. Um, so that night you get eliminated. You go back to the, um, to the, uh, the villa and you get food. And then in their room, they've got all your the lollies that you love or your biscuits or you start eating that the first night i, I couldn't sleep i did not sleep yeah, right. an absolute wink um that first night back in the room and with that when i did come back back home i couldn't sleep in my bed properly um wow. it's probably it probably would have been a good month at stages i was getting my pillow from my bed because my bed was just too soft i wasn't used to it i would get my pillow and i would sleep on the floor put the blanket wow. on and just sleep yeah. on, the, on the hard floor that because it's seven weeks. Seven weeks is like anything. You you do something for ten days, um, for uh, every day for ten days. It, it develops as a habit. Um, and for me, I just couldn't sleep properly. I was tossing and turning, having a restless sleep, sit, sleeping on a on a softer bed. Um, That's crazy. So yeah, it took yeah, it could. So that was probably yeah, six eight weeks really to sleep properly and spend a whole night in bed and um, and have good quality sleep in, in a bed. Um, 
But food, yeah, it did take a little while because I wanted to try to keep the weight off because it was, it was going to help me for football. So yeah. I tried to then get back into a normal, healthy sort of diet where I still had uh, my coffee in the morning, but then just tried to eat a, a little bit lighter, which which was able to be done because of obviously not eating too much food for uh, seven weeks. Like you, you splurge yeah. and you want to have your, your lollies, but... <laughs> With that, it still takes you a while because you do start feeling sick because it's something you haven't had for a long period of time. It just doesn't sit too well for you. So, yeah, it's a good couple of weeks for, for food-wise uh, to get back into normal yes. routine. The sleep, that's a crazy one, the sleeping thing. Yeah. Uh, I'll do one more from the viewers, and I've got some short, sharp ones we'll finish with. Uh, yeah. Do you think the AFL is changing heaps in the last five years? How do you rate it? Are you enjoying it today? And would you ever go on, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here? <laughs> um. Yeah, football has changed. You can probably see that with the rules now, with the litigation, with with head contact on on how much that's probably changed the game in, in the last um, last sort of six months. Really, um, that's mm. gone crazy with that. And, um, you see evolution in the game. If it's rule changes, that changes the look of the game. If it's sides start playing a little bit more defensively, but now you look at how um, Collingwood are playing, they're being so much more aggressive and taking the game on and it breaks up zones. So you'll see now sides will do that more because they understand that works. It is a copycat sort of um, environment that they're in it. As soon as one team has success, they're like, well, okay, maybe we've got to do the same thing and they'll just copy that as quickly as possible. So, um, which is good for the game. That's what the AFL wants. They, they want more goals. They want it to be more entertaining mm. and for the supporters and being more high energy. Um, with it being more high energy, you see that they're bringing an extra sub, which is really you've got five people on, on, the, on the bench now. So yeah. um, that all provides it, the game to be quicker, um, more appealing for the people to stay involved in it. And when it's high scoring and high intensity, that's what people want. Um, all right. And it was, that was the last bit of that question. Um, the last bit was, oh, would you go on, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here? Oh, yes. No, I wouldn't. No. Um, ostriches, anuses, probably it's not my cup of tea. <laughs> um, and I, I can handle snakes and stuff like that. But w when you see those, when they put the clear um, cylinders over their head and they've got spiders and that crawling over them, no not, thanks. Not good. Not no. Good. I, know they, I know they get paid good money to do that. No, yeah. thank you. No, I don't, care. No, I don't care how much you pay me. I don't care how hungry I am. I'm not sticking <laughs> not my head me. in a cylinder with spiders. No, thank you. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people who would agree with that. Yeah. All right, the last thing we'll do, I'll, I'll rattle off a couple of questions, just quick fire answers, which we do with all, all of our guests. One of them we've mm -hmm. already spoken about, but I'll ask it again anyway. So yep. I'll do it as the first one. Tomato sauce, fridge or cupboard? Uh, that is cupboard. Nintendo or PlayStation? PlayStation. Least favourite beverage? Oh, Jesus. Ah, least favourite beverage. Um, I'm just looking at my alcohol cupboard here. Um, ah, ooh, ooh, ooh. Least favourite. Least favourite beverage. I, I love drinks. Um, what if we go most favourite then? Is that easiest? Oh, yeah. Anything bubbly. I, I love anything bubbly. Anything on a Coke, no sugar. But even soda water, just bubbles. I love bubbles. Favourite pizza topping? Uh, salami. And for bonus points, does pineapple belong on pizza? Um, I'm happy for it too. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm happy for it. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, not a tomato person in a burger. I know yeah, pineapple so, no. it, it has a different texture to it, but like, I don't like a, a, a piece of tomato in a burger because I find that's just too overpowering. In a burger yeah. where everything else is soft, you get the harder tomato. No thanks. Uh, what's your go-to karaoke song? Oh no, uh, uh, Shannon. Oh, what about me? If you're at a swing pool, do you cannonball into the pool or do you dip a toe in first? I uh, know I'm I'm a slowly toe and just creep in. Nice oh, but if it's if it's my own pool, I probably have it heated. To the right temperature anyway. oh, I wouldn't. you wouldn't have to dip the tater straight in <laughs> no 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 I'd, I'd set it to a reasonably high temperature make sure of that but in saying that cost of cost of living at the moment um yeah i'll probably have to just save some money on this i might just have to slowly creep in and the uh, the last um, one does chocolate live in the fridge or the cupboard this one divides a lot of people oh no i i'm in the cupboard i'll find the cupboard, it, it gets, yeah. you can't have it too hard then you, it's like a lollipop you're sucking on it yeah, you know, I like, you know, I like to be able to, territory. 
Yeah, you get in the cupboard, you at least you put it in the mouth and within sort of ten seconds it's getting soft already. You don't want to be yeah. sitting in there for three or four minutes waiting for it. No. <laughs> Defeats the purpose, doesn't it? No, hundred percent. All right. I want no, the that, chocolate that, now. I want the chocolate now. I don't want it in five minutes. Yeah, don't <laughs> exactly. It's a it's a impulse eating item. Yeah. It's not a yeah, cool. future plan. All right, well, that does it for tonight, Brian. Thank you so much, mate, for jumping on. I really appreciate it. Um, like I said, there's so much to cover because it's such a decorated career, yeah. inside and outside of football, but I really appreciate your honesty and the stories and everything like that. It was mm -hmm. fascinating. No worries, Chris. Thank you, mate. Thank you for having me. And no, make sure you, you, get, you get to really look after that cup, uh, that uh, shed you've got. Really organise that a little bit better. I oh, know. So the problem is we've got a home <laughs> business as well. So a lot yeah, of it's oh. my wife's stuff. So I'll, I'll oh. have that to blame her. But yeah. maybe it's my fault yeah, for not okay. keeping it too organised. But yeah, you uh, got fancy lights and background. I'll make sure I'll uh, upgrade from a projector to a big screen TV. I'm yeah, a little absolutely. bit old school with that. Yeah, Wait for the, uh, the big I'll LCDs to go on sale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 100%. All right. Thank you again, mate. Much appreciated. Um, hope everyone enjoyed that. And we'll uh, see you for the next show, whenever that might be. So thank you again, Brian. You're a superstar. No worries, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, mate. What an absolute treat it was to have Brian on the show tonight. Some amazing stories, um, an amazing decorated career, and there were so many questions to ask me about. So I'm really, really appreciative of his time tonight. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button, and we'll get some more players on in the future. I hope you had a good night and enjoyed that interview.